three students. One conversation where film theory collides with the reality of filmmaking. Life after film school. Today's guest, Vicki Jensen, director of the Fox Searchlight release, Post Grad. Graduation day! Everyone say overpriced college education. I have an interview at 10 o'clock. How'd it go? I asked the VP if she was pregnant. She was just fat. Oh. You're not supposed to come back when you've already left the nest. <laughs> Vicki, thank you so much for coming in. Sure, this is fun. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> we always start out the show with the same first question. Please finish the following sentence. Oh, boy. The most important thing someone should know before graduating from film school is? Well, I would say um, uh, make a lot of films. Make a lot of short films. Do, do film gymnastics to get your mistakes out of the way. You'll keep making more, but at least you'll get all the cliches out of the way. So when you were young, you started drawing a lot, but you went beyond that and you became pretty good. And your sister gave you your first job as a cell painter? Well, back in the ancient times, um, cell painters filled in the colors of, um, a, you know, a character was animated on paper and, and Xerox threw a really complicated process onto acetate sheets. And then anyway, you flip it over and you paint the colors in and it's a really good first job. My sister and her husband at the time had a little animation company and they did just these goofy little animated commercials that were really popular when we were kids. So when I was babysitting for them, I painted cells and made a whopping $5 an hour. Wow. <laughs> Those big bucks. Now, back in the 40s, though, that was the only job women could have in animation. I have a letter from Walt Disney Studios that was rejecting a, um, a young woman who was applying to be an animator there. And they, they basically said, um, you know, women don't, don't work in the creative field. Uh, that's, that's reserved for only young men. So you're welcome to apply to our ink and paint department. They called it ink and trace back then. It's a different time. Uh, <laughs> different time. Wow, yeah. yeah. So you started college at the Academy of Arts in San Francisco. And then to help pay for school, you spent the summers working at Hanna-Barbera. Yeah, on... no, I was studying painting. I really okay. didn't plan to go into animation. Okay. I thought I'd be, you know, a, a, a painter, a fine art painter. But you ended up on the Smurfs and the Flintstones, which is yes, a big I contrast. Yes, I did. Well, back then, I was painting backgrounds, um, which for me was really fun, because as a kid, I remember watching animated movies and not really paying as much attention to the characters, just sort of all backgrounds. Um, I loved Bambi, sure, but I thought, oh, if I could be painting all the trees and the grass and just, they look like real paintings. Maybe that, that was the reason. So mm -hmm. getting my first job at Hanna-Barbera as a um, apprentice background painter was really exciting. So I was learning how to do Smurf clouds and, <laughs> and um, you know, Flintstone houses and how to use a sponge and all of this stuff. And so I would come into the studio and, and pick up a few more techniques and then kind of befriended the supervisor and eventually um, got to work there full time. Now you then made the transition from background painting to being a storyboard artist for shows like He-Man and, and Batman. What, what's the difference between a storyboard artist and a background artist? Well, a background artist is really, you're actually painting the scenery that you're going to see on camera. Story artist or storyboard artist takes the script and visualizes it for the first time. So. Work on He-Man was really tough. It was, um, you know, 25 minute script every month. Um, and you also had to um, figure out how to keep the costs low. He-Man was the last show fully animated in the U.S. So it was really, really cheap. It was, it was a crazy, crazy <laughs> job. So then you eventually started working live action. What was your um, first roles in those projects and how did it help further your career? Uh, when I started in, in live action, it was as a storyboard artist still because that was my skill and that's how I kind of weaseled my way in. <laughs> so I did storyboards for a lot of commercials and, um, uh, and a, a couple of features. I worked on a John Hughes movie. He'd never worked with a storyboard artist, but he was using a second unit director that he wanted to control. And so he had me draw everything out that the second unit would have to, to do. Um, I worked with uh, Wayne Wang on, um, on one of his early films as well uh, called Slam Dance, which is a very 80s kind of film. Mm -hmm. And he wanted me to board every frame of the movie. So that helped me understand the process a little bit better. Um, the next challenge that I really wanted to do, which for me, having been a background painter, production design for a feature felt like the natural next step. Mm -hmm. If you're an artist, then you're going to deal with the look. 
you know, the whole look of the show. Mm -hmm. So I was working on this really low budget horror movie um, and I kept going as I was all the time, just nattering on about wanting to be a production designer and I wanted to meet their production designer. And they'd hired an old coot who, who just quit because the budget was just so minuscule. Mm -hmm. He quit and they looked at me and they said, oh, so you want to do it? I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I spent nine weeks in the former Yugoslavia you know, figuring out how to do production design. And, and one thing I'm proud about is that it was a million, $1 million movie and they said I made it look like a $2 million movie. So that felt good. Nice. <laughs> Double the production value. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, that's a feather in my hat. <laughs> but you still didn't stray too far from animation because you did Fern Gully, The Last Rainforest in 1992. Yeah. I jumped back and forth all the time between animation and, and live action. So after doing, you know, commercials, um, in, you know, for live action, then, then a design job would come up in animation, and I hadn't done that before. So Fern Gully was one of those things that I'd worked with the Croyers, Bill and Sue Croyer, who, who produced the show, and they were talking about making this, this feature, and I, I jumped at the chance. I helped them develop the look of the show. Uh, we went to Australia and worked with um, naturalists and took hikes and got covered with leeches and all this oh, stuff that you just wow. don't do in animation. And we came up with enough artwork to sell to the financiers the idea for the project. And having been there at the inception, I, I got to be one of the art directors on it. So later on, you actually considered going to film school and applied to AFI. Why? I wanted to, to try film school. So uh, I applied I, uh, to AFI. I, I uh, created a reel. I had to write an essay about why, what filmmaking meant to me, <laughs> you know? It's, Wrote the same one. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was great, you know? Um, and, uh, and I got rejected, which is something that was fun a few years later. AFI invited me back to come in and talk about production design, that sort of thing, so I got to rub it in a little bit. So it didn't work out AFI, but you got the job at DreamWorks Animation. How did that happen? Not being an animator, um, there was really nothing I could do but show storyboards and, and paintings that were from shows like Mighty Mouse and Ren and Stimpy that didn't really apply, but, um, but I made a lot of good impressions on people, and so I think that that's probably what, what helped, that, that a couple of friends who just gotten in the story team could let the directors know she knows what she's doing, she's gonna be an asset. So during your time at DreamWorks, uh, Shrek was in development. Can you talk about what your role was early on in the project and how you became promoted as director? When I came on, um, Chris Farley had just passed away. Uh, they had animated one sequence with him as a test in CG. Um, and, uh, and while that was relatively successful, without him as the, the voice, it kind of lost its footing. So they were looking to start over again. So I got hired as a board artist on it. And I saw a screening that was a little bit of a patchwork. It had a bit of action adventure to it. And then it had these really weird ass sequences that were just hilarious. And the filmmakers at the time were trying to like, we can't fit these together. And these over here are funny but weird. And, you know, and they were sort of <laughs> leaning into this land of the, you know, bigger movie mm -hmm. and um, Excalibur. And, and I'm like, no, you gotta go this way. And the louder I got, the more people listened, and I got promoted to head of um, the story team, one of the co-heads of story team, and then just about four months later, I was made um, a director. And then we started production just like, like um, six weeks later. Now, after directing Shrek, you went on to direct Shark Tale, which is another animated feature film, but then decided you wanted to go back into live action directing, which led you to your short film. <laughs> Why'd you decide to make a short film? I knew I wanted to go in, into, into live action, and, and after Shrek came out, I you know, went about finding an agent and all of that, but I got kind of nervous about actually getting a movie and, um, and, and learning my lessons on somebody else's dime. You know, I just thought that might not be the best plan. I have to learn how to make my mistakes faster and, and kind of get all these cliches out of the way um, before I find myself on, on, you know, somebody else's, in somebody else's, you know, sandbox. Why do I want this job? I'm driven, full of ideas, upbeat. Most importantly, I'm incredibly enthusiastic about the work your company is doing. Really? Like what? Aim, aim, aim. Your latest film, Postgrad is about a college graduate who finds herself unemployable and has to move home with her parents in the valley. 
and it's produced by Jeffrey Clifford and the legendary Ivan Reitman. Why do you think it was that they brought you in to direct this film? Well, um, Ali Bell is also one of the she, one of the producers on on the movie, and she'd been championing this script for a while. And she remembered some stories I told her years ago, when we had sort of a general meeting um, about my own eccentric family. And um, I think she, it just she she remembered that and just thought it would be a really great fit. So I went in and, and met with them. Uh, met with uh, Ali and Jeff and Ivan and a whole room full of people and uh, we just talked about uh, the script and, and why, you know, I just thought I got, I got that character and I understood that, that story. So you said that in this film you've wrapped truth inside of humor and fun. Can you talk a little bit about what that means? Um, yeah, what I mean by that is, is that um, uh, sometimes the best way to get through to people is with humor. Um, and the kind of humor that always appealed to me is stuff that's really based in reality, stuff that you can actually see happens, that you can believe it, that it, that it would actually happen. I'm not a big hijinks person, you know. I, I'm not crazy about characters flying through the air because they got, you know, flicked off a cruise ship or something like that and survive <laughs> it. I, I don't know, that's not where my head goes. But really, I, I like humor that comes out of character and out of situations. And, mm -hmm. and if you can recognize yourself in it, then then it's a bonus. People are like, oh, I, I, my aunt is just like that, or, or mm -hmm. oh my God, I said the same thing. Oh, I'm such an idiot. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's the kind of humor that, that I really like, and, and that's when a recognition or a, a truth is revealed or remembered. We know what is the right thing to do. We, we know that you don't get everything that you will want all the time, you know, but when we don't, we pout. So if a character goes through that and you recognize the silliness of it, you can laugh at them and learn for yourself. Now, aside from working with Alexis Bledel and Zach Guilford in postgrad, you've also had a chance to work with some pretty comedic heavyweights like Michael Keaton, Carol Burnett, and Jane Lynch. I'm curious as to how rehearsals went. You know, as a directing student myself, sometimes I find the rehearsal process a bit intimidating. How to walk the line between being uh, authoritative but also respecting the actors and hearing what they have to say. H how did that work out with all these big name actors? Um, the rehearsal process. Uh, went really well. I mean, we didn't take two weeks before production and rehearse the whole movie or anything like that. Um, you know, like a lot of films these days where, where the schedules are tight, um, you rehearse wherever you can mm -hmm. and grab every moment that you can to rehearse. So, you know, we'd, we'd collect together on the set and read through the, the script together and, and everybody was very open, completely um, willing to do whatever, you know, we could do. and. I didn't feel any kind of um, ego coming from them. They, they were honest questions. If they didn't understand what was going on in the in the scene, you know, I fine. Stop everything. Hold the crew. Let's sit and talk about it and figure this out. Um, and the the concerns were always really genuine. It wasn't about any anything else other than trying to understand what what the scene required. Um, but it was sometimes it was meeting alone with Alexis or maybe with Michael Keaton and and, and just talking about the scene and what may what else might be in there. Um, and there'd be arguments and then you know I'd win. <laughs> So you've spoken about your directing techniques, and during this film you use such techniques as act like a shark or pretend you just drank an entire keg of Red Bull. Were there particular directing techniques that worked with different actors on the film? Did I say those things? Yeah, I'm quoting you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually. Yeah, rather than, you know, um, telling an actor, uh, uh, you know, make it bigger, which is just, it's so vague and, um, and weak, and, and it makes the actor self-conscious. They, they end up looking at themselves going, am I making it big enough for her? And I don't want them in their head. I want them to have an effect on the other person. So if, if I, I might say, you know, bite her head off with that line, you know, instead, or, or, or you know, um, like you said, you know, I, you know, attack her like a shark, you know, don't let her, don't let up. You know, I want you to argue.